Hey everyone, Mr. Wineland here uh, with Oklahoma History, Chapter 14, Section 1. Uh, we're going to go over a few things here. Um, we're talking about the Roaring Twenties, so uh, we're going to get into this a little bit. Um, the thing about the Roaring Twenties is that um, it provided a lot of opportunity uh, for growth in our state, um, but it also is going to set up what we're going to talk about and that is the Great Depression. It, what we have to understand is that the Roaring Twenties, the reason why it was so called the Roaring Twenties is that every there was no consequences. There was just, you know, full-on enjoyment and enjoying the success of life, but not really preparing or being ready for the consequences of things fell apart. And that's what ultimately happened uh, as we'll go into the next section is things will fall apart, uh, not just for Oklahoma, but for the rest of America. But during that time, we see the 1910s, you know, our population was roughly oh, almost to 1.7 million. 19% uh, of that was in the urban setting cities. In the 1920s, you had over 2 million. 27 for that is in the cities. And then by 1930, you have just right around 2.3 million and 34 percent of that is in the cities and i would say today our our population is roughly right around over four million um and i would say over 50 percent of that is in cities today and what i mean by cities i'm not just talking about like still uh tulsa or um oklahoma city we're also talking about um suburbs or uh, college communities um growing larger cities um that have have grown over the years and we've seen that happen in oklahoma we're becoming less and less rural and we're becoming more and more urban uh but the roaring 20s we see a wide range of events that unfolded during this time and there's a advancements in technology you see automobiles uh airplanes communication uh household items are being uh created so technology is really shaping this era and we see oklahoma as part of that of uh being a part of um, that whole success, but there's also some some things not going so great. Um, uh, we see that Oklahoma, like its uh, like you know the rest of the country, had its own share of labor fights, racial clashes, bank and train robberies, mob whippings. So things going on. So there's a lot of social unrest. Uh, part of that plays out during World War One. Returning soldiers turned their attention to finding jobs and homes. Both were short in supply. You see agriculture, mineral industries were uh, prospered during the war. Um, they were getting a lot of um, materials out to the, the U.S. government that needed it. But then once the war was over, the, the supply was down and ultimately, or, and the demand went down as well. Um, so, or demand went down, so then supply went down as well. So uh, that caused some shutdowns after the war. So high demand for short supply of consumer goods caused a period of inflation, increase in prices and services. Uh, we see some power uh, decreasing there. Um, many workers, uh, we see during this time, um, thought uh, throughout the Oklahoma use strikes to argue better pay. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Also during this time, you had the thing called the Red Scare. Communism was on the rise in over there in Russia and starting to kind of make its way into certain parts of the world. People were concerned about communism coming into uh, America. So that caused a bit of a scare. Also, you had the Ku Klux Klan reorganized in 1915. Um, a lot of people thought that it had been wiped out during Reconstruction, but it made a, it made a comeback. And uh, we see white supremacy uh, really started to really make a head into this country. Um, part of the reason why we have some of the problems we've had today is because of uh, of 1915, but uh, a lot of native-born Protestants were uh, joining, <clears throat> um, going after not just you know native, uh, not just uh, African Americans, but going after you know they were anti-Native American, they're anti-Catholic, they're anti-Jewish, like I said, after anti-African American, opposed immigration, labor unions, um, so just pretty much anything that would hurt white citizens, basically, is what they felt, um, which was a lot of hatred, a lot of bad things happening. Uh, people were beaten, um, people were given death threats or warnings, whippings, lynchings. Uh, this is where an age where we're, we're seeing lynching is still um, uh, a big systemic problem. Um, basically, where 
Um, people get so angry instead of, you know, working out through the problem or trusting the justice system to handle it. People, you know, basically took care of, felt like it was their own right to take care of themselves, even if it meant um, being judge and jury. And uh, lynching was a big problem, um, killing a lot of African Americans um, unjustly and uh, and just brutally murdering people. So um, this was just a rough time. Uh, And and you can kind of see some of that, um, you know, in some ways, some of that history playing out even in our modern day, uh, modern day history. Uh, but uh, definitely KKK were very violent during this time and made things a lot worse, um, especially in the case of the Tulsa Massacre. Um, Tulsa Massacre used to be called the Tulsa Race Riots, but that's kind of an incorrect uh, way to go about it because I think a lot of people, you know, for many years when they tried to talk about it, they were just like, well, it was justified from both sides, you know, that that basically both races, you know, were, were part of the problem. But what we're actually really seeing with the Tulsa, the history of the Tulsa Massacre is that no, actually, technically, it was more that the African American community were, were victims in this tragedy, because really, that's what it was—a um, tragedy in Greenwood, uh, the Greenwood district, which is you know, if you go to Tulsa today, it's uh, right around the uh, the Drillers Ballpark, uh, Oklahoma State University down there, uh, parts of downtown uh, Tulsa. That's really where that district is, and we see that. Um, um, Possibly one of the worst riots. I should probably correct this. Um, it's one of the m- worst riots in um, in American, uh, not just in American, but in uh, Tul- in Tulsa, not just in Tulsa, but American history. So, uh, but we see May thirtieth, nineteen twenty one. Dick Rowland uh, at the age of nineteen. Um, he was an African American man. He was a, sh- uh, a shoe shine man. And uh, basically, he came from, um, you know, you know, mostly North Tulsa area, um, but basically had used the elevator many times um, in this Tulsa office building. And apparently um, he was trying to get to a colored washroom. um, And basically there was a woman um, who was on the elevator. Um, All we know is that, again, based on the the allegations, Dick Rowland rushes off the elevator after a scream is heard. And ultimately it's a, uh, uh, the white woman was a white girl with Sarah page. Um, there really was no accusation per se, but people went rushed to judgment assuming that she was attacked. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of whites uh, gathered in town demanding punishment for Roland. Uh, he was accused for assaulting Sarah page, even though we don't know it happened. Apparently it didn't happen, but again, People in their minds thought this happened. So um, instead of trusting the justice system, people took it in their own hands. Um, this caused a lot of tension as people were angry. Uh, crowds, white, white crowds were gathering around the courthouse. Um, black ca- crowds gathered as well. Both sides had guns. And next thing you know, um, somehow a, sh- a shot was fired and it triggered this big, massive response where um, violence broke out and the National Guard had to come out and... Um, it called in and it, it panicked black citizens who sought to escape from the city because what ended up happening is in the Greenwood district, um, there was what is called Black Wall Street. Um, Wall Street, you know, in New York City, it's a thriving business district. <clears throat> it's where we have the stock market. You have a lot of uh, the, you know, some of your b- uh, biggest business uh, moguls down there, um, you know, trading and working out business deals in New York City. It's kind of the, it's the, it's the city of business, not just in the, in the United States, but around the world in New York City. And so um, in Tulsa, at one point in time, they had Black Wall Street, which was, was a lot of black businesses, owned businesses that were thriving in, um, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they were actually making individuals wealthy, uh, black individuals who, who were making a name for themselves. Uh, but, you know, there, <clears throat> even before the Tulsa massacre, there was a lot of tension with Black Wall Street and other white businesses that even some in, uh, some individuals were jealous, um, you know, of, of the success of, of black uh, men and women having businesses that were thriving. So when the Tulsa massacre happened, uh, white mobs started to gather and they started to attack Greenwood. And uh, and basically it got so bad that there, they had to get firefighters in there, but the firefighters couldn't get there because uh, whites were keeping them away and, and trying to basically see it burn. 
Uh, the end result is 26 blacks and 13 whites killed, hundreds injured, 35 square blocks of greenwood burned. And um, Dick Rowland, for answer number what? excuse me, is uh, no, he was not. But we don't know. I would probably put no, we don't know. Because what ended up happening after this whole thing is a lot of African Americans uh, did not tell the story for many years because there was a lot of embarrassment, there was a lot of shame. Um, even w the the whites, the uh, white citizens of Tulsa who were involved in this didn't want to be associated with it or talk about it. So it's a very dark time in Tulsa history, and it took several several years before we, the, the truth would come out. Uh, we also see a growth in the oil industry during the 1920s. Oklahoma's oil reserves began to be tapped prior to the 1920s. After the war, oil prices eventually fell from three dollars and fifty cents because, you know, a lot of that oil was going overseas uh, to um, to the war. Now that the war is, you know, not needing the demands, not there. Um, there's too much supply, so obviously prices drop. Glut of oil caused further price drops, so producers cut production, which is the answer number five. In 1931, fields in Texas and Oklahoma Panhandle and southwest Kansas output was slowed until connected by the pipeline in Chicago. Uh, with the discovery well of number one drilled in Indiana Territory, illuminating oil in southeast Oklahoma City, produced more than one million barrels of oil. A forest of derricks surrounded Oklahoma City, one uh, country's richest uh, definition of petro uh, petrochemicals. Chemicals derived from petro petroleum, natural gas industry began in 1926, creating uh, formaldehyde and alcohols. Later made solvents, uh, photographic chemicals, medicines, refrigerants. So a lot of our, you know, these chemicals that are needed for certain products to, you know, to cool things or to, uh, you know, be mixed in different types of uh, chemical mixtures come from the petroleum business. So we were able to convert the oil into these different types of chemicals. Um, also, coal production peaked to 5 million in 1920. Zinc and lead mines, Northeast Oklahoma, employed over 11,000 men during their peak production years in the mid-1920s. Farmers were able to buy more land during the war, increase prices of crops. By 1922, cotton was the most valued crop in Oklahoma, fourth in the United States. But the crop was more in supply than demand, and the farm prices started to tumble as well. Uh, other industries, we see uh, mechanized uh, mechanized. Uh, Farm equipment, excuse me, was slow to move into Oklahoma. We see money was the issue. Size of the fields did not, you know, basically justify the means to buy a new tractor. Um, <clears throat> um, even though uh, we do see that um, the size of the fields did not make the new tractors and equipment cost effective. We see in 1920, though, 3% of Oklahoma farmers had tractors, but number of tractors would quickly end by 1930s. We see the number of tractors, 1928 was around roughly under 20,000, and then it was at 46,000 in 1939, so a big jump there. Aviation is starting to take off. First actual airport was built in the flat farmland in Oklahoma City in 1910, uh, and early runways were flat fields of grass. Uh, we see Henry Post Army Field of uh, Fort Sill was around World War I, Brains, uh, barnstormers. World War I pilots did stunt shows, gave rides for a fee. By 1990, barnstormer Duncan A. McKintry established the McKintry Airport in Tulsa. Um, we see 1930, 70,000 people through Tulsa Airport, one of the busiest in the world. Uh, Curtis Southwest Airplane Company, Spartan School Aeronautics, and Braniff started during its time. Spartan School Aeronautics actually has a museum, and it's pretty, pretty good from, um, based on uh, what I've seen. Uh, Wiley Post, um, he was a uh, you know an aviator, uh, famous aviator, solo around the world in eight days, fifteen hours, and fifty one minutes. Uh, we see uh, motoring the automobile and uh, moving assembly line helped reduce the cost of automobiles during this time. So more and more automobiles are on the road. Sales quickly uh, got underway by nineteen twenty nine. There were twenty three million cars registered in, in America. And Congress wanted to create a highway uh, to connect Virginia to, to California, so coast to coast. And we see that Cyrus Avery worked to get the road routed through Tulsa and Oklahoma City, known as Route 66, better known as the mainstream, uh, Main Street of America, to bring attention to roads, uh, Route 66, uh, th over 3,400-mile 
Transcontinental Foot Race. The Bunyan Derby was held March 4th, 1928. 275 runners left starting line at Los Angeles, hoping to win $25,000 prize. Uh, we see life was good during this time in the, in the 1920s. Fashion was on the rise. Motion pictures had, were uh, with silent movies and talkies were starting to get to come together. Uh, jazz music was popular during this time. A lot of home appliances, refrigerators, vacuums, dishwashers, uh, most towns. Um, we see that uh, most towns had the vaudeville and movie theaters or opera houses. Okmogee Hippodrome Theater was uh, an opera house which opened in 1921, had a swimming pool in the basement of the ballroom on the second floor. Uh, again, the inventions changed the lives of Americans uh, through entertainment. We see Fiver McGee and Molly was a famous radio show. We see radio starts to really make its way into, um, into people's households. Uh, Will Rogers had famous Wild West shows with his witty radio newspaper comedy. The radio actually helped tap people into society because not a lot of people could travel, um, but it helped them hear the news around, around the world and know what was going on. Uh, Mary Alice Robertson was the first woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Oklahoma. Uh, Democrats won the majority of the seats in the state legislature, and John C. Walton was elected governor in 1922 by a wide margin. Walton clashed with conservatives as well as some prominent liberals and radicals on a number of issues. Uh, news, newspapers criticized him for the use of martial law and leniency to prisoners, which is answer number nine. You pause, you can. Uh, number two is right there, and number three is down here. Walton uh, was impeached, charged with 22 counts, convicted of 11, and removed from office after 10 months. Walton per, uh, provided did provide free text with the students. State prohibited teaching evolution over biblical theory. In 1925, uh, Tennessee similar law challenged the famous uh, it challenged in the famous Scopes trial, with, in which a teacher was charged with teaching Darwin's theory of evolution. And which, by the way, if you really look into the Scopes trial, it was really mostly a publicity stunt. It was uh, basically the town in Tennessee. Uh, was kind of struggling, needed some financial boost to get the attention to get people into town, buy things, get the economy going. And so they saw that the um, that they were basically trying to the lawyer was basically trying to get this um, try a case in Tennessee. And uh, basically the town found a teacher that was like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of believe in evolution. And basically they got this law firm in. They they did what they had to do to get the, the, the trial going. Uh, they ended up losing, but that's what they wanted to lose so they can eventually get it to the Supreme Court. So um, it, it, I wouldn't call it a hoax, but it definitely was. It was definitely a show. Um, it definitely was not genuine, but uh, it did kind of ultimately make its way to the Supreme Court. But uh, it all mostly started with Tennessee. But it's kind of a funny story. All right, that's going to do it for the notes. See ya.